Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Ranch Mirage Public Library. Um, our lecture today is on Desert Bighorn Sheep Wilderness Icon, presented by Mark Jorgensen. And um, our topic turned out to be especially timely today because I don't know if you saw the newspaper today, but we did have a visitor um, in La Quinta um, between Highway 111 and um, Washington, I believe. So apparently he came down and then he was scooted back up the, up the mountain. Um, how many of you have seen uh, or remember the days when the desert bighorn sheep came down the mountain and saw them on the street and yeah, we remember those days. We don't see them very much anymore. Um, how many of you not been here today before? Not been to the library before? If you haven't, we're delighted to have you here. Um, and hope you enjoy today's programs and all of our offerings. It is the Ranch Mirage Public Library Foundation, the fundraising arm of the library that presents all of our programs here. Um, Mark's, Mark Jorgensen has spent five decades studying and tracking desert bighorn sheep throughout their range. In his 36th year in California State Parks, he has served as state park ranger resource ecologist, and as superintendent of the Anza Borrego Desert State Park. He is a member of the technical staff of the Desert Bighorn Council and is an advisor to the Bighorn Institute. He has written a beautiful new book called Desert Bighorn Sheep, Wilderness Icon, which I think some of you have taken a look at, at in the back of the room. Um, the, the picture is especially beautiful, and um, we're so pleased to welcome um, Mark to the, to the library today. So with that, please give him a nice warm Ranch Mirage Public Library welcome. Thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to be invited here and really great to have such a nice group. And uh, a lot of people here who know a lot about bighorn sheep and see them all the time. So uh, I'm among friends and uh, really glad to be here. The um, newspaper article about a sheep coming down to the uh, cliff house at the intersection of uh, Highway 111 in Washington is uh, really appropriate. And it's gonna help me later on in my program when I talk about um, how sheep and civilization don't mix very well. I know if you golf over at La Quinta or Indian Wells, there are four golf courses over there right now with sheep coming down regularly. Um, it's a pretty neat thing to have the wilderness icon coming down, you know, onto the golf green. But, um, and it's a great place to take your friends to see sheep. But the um, studies that have been done on the interaction between sheep and civilization show that you know, being down at the intersection of 111 in Washington is not a healthy place for a 200 pound ram. And if you've lived here quite a while, you know that right here across the street at the Desert Animal Hospital was the site of quite a few uh, sheep mortalities. There were six or seven bighorn killed along Highway 111 and Highway 74 before the fence was constructed that keep sheep from coming down into Thunderbird and down onto Highway 111. So the Bighorn Institute had done a long-term study on mortality of sheep in this area and found, um, I think about seven killed by cars, seven died of oleander poisoning, a single leaf from an oleander will kill a bighorn sheep, one drowned in a swimming pool, one strangled on a fence, and one had a huge load of parasites which we feel it probably contracted off the, the wet turf, the grass. These parasites can't really survive up on the dry slopes, but they can survive quite well and reproduce and go through the sheep um, down on the wet grass. So um, very happy to be here. We'll talk about um, desert bighorn sheep in general. They are an animal that is found in seven western states within the U.S and six states in Mexico. Their numbers right now are higher than they've been in decades. There are about 31,000 desert bighorn sheep 
and that's up considerably from a few years ago. The uh, desert bighorn is uh, found in the seven southwest states in northern Mexico from Texas all the way to up near Death Valley, Nevada, out to southwest Colorado, and almost down to the tip of Baja, California. The other color patterns that you see, the one off on the right, you might be familiar with if you live up in Montana, uh, Wyoming, Colorado, it's the Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep. And if you live in British Columbia, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, you might be familiar with what uh, are called the California bighorn. And as you notice, California bighorn's no longer found in California. It's that gold up there. And then the uh, kind of dark gold or rusty brown out there by itself is another race of bighorn sheep found in the Sierra Nevada. And they're genetically uh, different than the sheep that we have down here in the peninsular ranges. So our desert sheep are found in four North American deserts. One called the Chihuahuan Desert, Texas, Northern Mexico, uh, Coahuila, Chihuahua, New, New Mexico. The Sonoran Desert, which we are part of, we live in what's called the Colorado Desert, which is a, a unit of the Sonoran Desert. So that's uh, the state of Sonora, Mexico, southern Arizona, southeast California, and the Mojave Desert, which uh, is not too far off to our northeast. Half of Joshua Tree National Park is in the Mojave and half is in the Colorado Desert. So all the way up to Death Valley, uh, Nevada, southern Nevada, northwest Arizona, and then uh, the Great Basin Desert, which would you might think of uh, Zion and Bryce and um, all of southern Utah, and then northern Arizona, the Arizona Strip, and all the way down to the Colorado River in the interior of the Grand Canyon. So these uh, various races of sheep have evolved to become supremely adapted to those uh, environments which it finds itself in, whether it's you know, 12,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains, or Alberta, or the depths of the Grand Canyon or Death Valley. Where do these sheep come from? We, ha we have in uh, sheep biology what we call the arc of the wild sheep that starts over really at the Mediterranean in Europe, comes all the way through Central Asia, Siberia, into Alaska and Canada, and all the way down to the tip of Baja. So at our Anza Borrego's sister park in the eastern Gobi of Mongolia, we have what's called the Argali sheep. And Argali are the largest wild sheep in the world. They get up to around 400 pounds. Massive horns, even larger than our desert bighorn. And uh, these animals had moved up and evolved into various races of sheep up into Siberia, the snow sheep, cross into Alaska, the, which became doll sheep and stone sheep. And then a branch came down into the Rocky Mountains and another branch came down into our Southwest deserts. So the Argali sheep is very well adapted to life out on the open steps. It's an open country runner. It's much longer legged than our desert bighorn. Usually you see our desert bighorn in very rough terrain when it's not crossing Highway 111. It's generally up in what we call escape terrain, very steep. So their stocky build and shorter legs serve them quite well in getting into that steep terrain. In the steppes of Mongolia, the sheep are probably eight to 10 inches taller, much longer legged, and they're open country runners. So when we startle sheep there on our hikes, they will tend to run like a pronghorn antelope for a half mile or a mile away they'll get up in the rocks and they'll turn around and look at us. But they're quite the runners. A friend sent me this picture around Christmas time and he said when he took it, it was minus 33 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is kind of the origins of our bighorn sheep. You can see a lot of the similar traits. We know that in the old world, 
in, uh, at our sister park in Mongolia, we find rock art that depicts Argali sheep and Siberian ibex. And here in uh, the southwest U.S., we find that the Native Americans were very closely tied to our wild sheep. There are entire uh, tribes and cultures that focused on bighorn sheep out in the Mojave Desert, the Coso Mountains, uh, the Valley of Fire State Park in Nevada. We find thousands of images of bighorn sheep depicted on petroglyphs and pictographs like this one taken in the Valley of Fire. So it's not hard to figure out why we call these bighorn. The uh, sheep, especially the males, have massive sets of horns. Uh, as you can see in this one, uh, it's all scarred up from head-to-head -head combat. He's probably broken his nose. He's got, you know, broken teeth. The tips of his horns are broomed off. But the females in uh, bighorn sheep also have horns. The ewes are much smaller, maybe 140 to 160 pounds, whereas the rams may be 180 to 230 or so. And the females um, have these horns that are very uh, spike-like and serve them well to protect themselves from small and medium-sized predators. Female uh, bighorn have been known to kill coyotes with their saber-like horns. Doesn't serve them well against mountain lions and larger predators. It also helps um, bighorn gain access to food. Since all of you who live here know that most uh, desert plants have spines and thorns, if you want to eat the inner flesh of a cactus, you better have some way to gain access to it. So they use horns for that. Female bighorn give birth to a, a single lamb once a year. They carry the lamb for six months in gestation. They're very good, attentive mothers. <coughs> and as you see, a little guy like this is just a few days old, is already up and about. He's born up in some of the rough, roughest country on the continent, but he better get up and be able to move and scale cliffs and he learns about cactus pretty rep rapidly, and he'll stick with his mother. She's isolated off by herself to give birth, and then within a few days she moves back to a group of other females. So the young lamb will uh, live off of its mother's milk. It will test uh, new foods and all that out in its environment. Uh, generally they will rely on their mother's milk until it gets too hot in uh, late June or July and the mother will start kicking them off. The goal is to be born about the same time as the first spring green up. So from the tip of Baja all the way up into Alberta you will see that the the optimum birthing time will get later and later. Down in Baja it might be quite early in January here in our area, the prime time is uh, mid-February and through March, and on up into Alberta, it might be May or early June. So you're born when the spring annuals in the grasses emerge. Best time for your mother to be able to get all the nutrition she needs to produce milk. If you're born too early, there's not much to eat. If you're born too late, May or June, mother's milk's probably going to dry up and you may not make it. So even with everything being perfectly timed, spring green up, good rainfall, uh, we have five lambs that are out scaling rock faces. You can imagine, you know, from human terms, their mothers would be down, sitting down there looking at their young on this 30-foot cliff, just totally freaking out. And indeed, out of these five lambs, how many do you think will still be alive at the end of summer? Probably one or two. If three out of five survived, we'd, we sheep fanatics would be uh, thrilled. But reality is that probably 20 to 40% of the lambs are going to make it through their first summer. And we find that the uh, common 
culprits are diseases to which they may not have proper um, antibodies to. We have young animals frequently get involved in accidents, in falls, predation, coyotes and mountain lions on uh, lambs. Very early on, though, bighorn sheep's going to learn how to really be adept at scaling this country, dropping off, you know, very steep escarpments to get down into canyon bottoms for food and water. Jeff Young is the photographer of this book, and one of his specialties is timing his photos when he gets all four feet off the ground. I get tons of compliments on the book back there at the table when I'm signing books. And so far, no one has said, I love your writing. <laughs> they all say, oh, what beautiful pictures. I say, thank you. But it's my partner. And uh, he's taken around 60,000 images of bighorn sheep, from which we had to select 200 for the book. So you can imagine there were a few little fist fights over selecting those 200. But he uh, really gets some amazing photos of these things in midair. Going downhill and going uphill. And for those of you who hike the trails around here, you know, you're pretty thankful that that trail's two, two or three feet wide. And you can imagine going up the face of a very loose scree slope like this. This ewe just is down at the bottom. She's determined. She knows she can do it. She's uh, very well adapted with her musculature and, her, and the, the hoof structure. She has a tough outer wall of her hoof, and then the pad of the hoof, the center of the hoof, uh, it, it kind of gives like, hard, like the hard heel of your, your foot if you spend a lot of time outdoors, and she gets a really good grip. So she can dig in in, in steep terrain or in snow or ice or mud and uh, very powerful. So the sheep have adapted to life in very steep escape terrain in our country. <coughs> we find desert sheep live from below sea level all the way to higher than 13,000 feet up in the White Mountains east of the Sierra Nevada. Very steep terrain. They spend some time out on the flats as evidenced by this one that showed up down on the flats yesterday at, uh, at the Cliff House. We know that during drought years, especially when the spring annuals green up first down here on the desert floor and on the alluvial fans, the sheep don't mind coming out as far as a half mile or a mile from the mountains to feed. They're quite vulnerable when they're away from steep terrain. When they come down to water, probably one of the more vulnerable times of their life, they have to have water uh, fairly often during the summertime. So for about five months, we'll find that their behavioral pattern centers around water. They'll move from remote ranges and they'll come back and spend much of their time within about a mile or a mile and a half of a water source. For about seven months out of the year, we find that the pregnant females move out into remote, isolated, mountain ranges, almost like island mountains, and we feel that they can survive without access to free water for up to about seven months. They're gaining the, or the moisture they need from the green forage that they eat. They have excellent digestive systems. They have the ability to withstand dehydration, and once they get to water, we've documented that they can drink uh, three to four and a half gallons at one city. So that's a lot, you know, four gallons is 32 pounds of water. But it puts them in a vulnerable position. They will spend a lot of time viewing from high uh, points on the, on the ridge, looking down toward water, looking for any kind of movement of people, coyotes, uh, mountain lions, golden eagles, anything that may cause harm. Once they get down to the water, you can see they're all eyes. And somebody often is, is standing up looking around 
for danger while the others put their heads down. But despite all these adaptations and wariness, predators like mountain lions are very successful in hunting for bighorn sheep in our area and actually throughout their range. Years ago, we saw the incidence of mountain lion predation was very low. As the mountain lion population increased, we started seeing an increase in the incidence of predation by lions, not only here in Southern California, but all the way down throughout the range in Mexico, uh, Texas, New Mexico, up into Utah. So a lion does not just look for sick and elderly and injured animals. They have excellent eyesight, they work at night, and they are on the lookout for any animal that could be possible food. And then they use a tactic of stalking and ambushing those animals. So, for instance, this large ram that this lion has been feeding on for several days, as far as we know, was quite a healthy, large, mature ram, probably 200 pounds. We set up a camera on this kill site the ram had a radio collar on it, so we knew where it was. Put a camera up, and uh, we got pictures of this mountain lion for about four or five nights in a row. Coyotes are not as excellent predators on mature bighorn sheep, but uh, they do seem to specialize in working on younger sheep and sick lambs. So they will hang out down near water holes in a thicket around a spring area where the vegetation is very thick, and they'll watch. And if they see a lamb coughing or falling behind, they'll wait till everybody gets down near the water, and they'll give chase. And that sick lamb, offer, often suffering from pneumonia or some respiratory ailment, may not be able to keep up with the rest of the herd and get up the slope. And that's when the coyote will take advantage of that. And very often the coyotes hunt in teams of two or three. So somebody's wading up, up the gully a little bit and you know they'll, they'll uh, ambush the lamb. So what does a sick lamb look like? You know, when you look at enough sheep or, or you've raised farm animals, you tend to know, you know what, they, what they look like when they're very healthy, doing well. Once they start looking kind of drawn in in the hindquarters there and their hair's a little scruffy, mouth open, tongue out, their ears droop, we consider that an animal in this condition is probably going to die in a day or two. Probably has pneumonia or some other respiratory problem. Um, a disease maybe they contracted from some distant contact with domestic livestock like sheep or goats. And this would be a prime target for coyotes. So probably the single biggest impact on North American bighorn in the history of, of uh, you know, human habitation and the introduction of, of animals and, and people to the western U.S. is probably the domestic sheep. We think that uh, probably in the 17, early 1800s, maybe a million to two million wild sheep lived in the western states in Mexico. And with the introduction of domestic livestock and their foreign diseases from the old world, uh, we think that probably hundreds of thousands of native sheep died from the inability to fend off these viruses and bacteria. Now, we have several folks on the Bighorn Institute here today, and they have spent the last uh, 33 years working on trying to isolate many of these diseases that affect our native bighorn sheep in this area, and they've made great strides in identifying a lot of those. We have trouble um, fighting exotic diseases because our patients uh, even if we were able to vaccinate them once, they don't come back for booster shots. And um, so the best thing we can do is isolate the native sheep from the domestic. And throughout the western United States, there are a lot of efforts underway to keep domestic sheep and goat grazing 
activities out of desert bighorn and, and Rocky Mountain bighorn habitat. We mentioned that the bighorn have a lot of wonderful adaptations. They, they must have. They've lived in the New World for more than a half million years. The oldest fossils we've discovered in two or three locations, including Anza Borrego, date back to about a half million. So to survive in a changing climate, um, what we call desertification that's occurred over the last 20 or 30,000 years, these animals have adapted to uh, extreme drought, to extracting moisture out of very dry, thorny plants, and they have an excellent digestive system. They're known as a ruminant. They have a very large first stage of their digestive system is called the rumen. So they will ingest plant materials like this cat's claw, which is a very thorny member of the pea family. You can see that it has dried seed pods all over it. It has uh, very nutritious leaves that are high in uh, protein and nitrogen. And so they're ingesting this down there on the, on the alluvial fans or in a canyon bottom, kind of a dangerous place for them, them to be. So they eat as rapidly as they can, and then they go back up into the steep terrain, and they'll sit down, lay down in a bed, or stand on a rock, and they will actually bring some of that material back up out of the rumen, and then they'll take the time to chew it. So this is what's called, called chewing their cud. And the way that the cud comes back up is that this material goes down into the rumen in this big vat, and if it's not chewed properly, the cell walls of the plants actually have air in them and they float. So as things float, they bring it back up, chew, chew, chew. You'll see them up there working their jaws, chewing their cud for hours. They'll swallow it again. If it's properly chewed, it will sink in the rumen and go down to the next chamber of their digestive system. So they're able to extract, you know, almost all the moisture and all the nutrition out of the plant material that they eat. They don't leave big piles like a horse or a burrow or a cow. They leave very small desiccated pellets. So they're eating material that's available. You know, in a dry year, an ocotillo might struggle to produce any flowers at all. Maybe, as you can see on this one, it hasn't produced any leaves, but it produced some flowers, and this animal takes advantage of that. Now, either she's uh, stuck herself in the lip with a thorn, or she's savoring, you know, the sweet nectar of that ocotillo flower. She's got her eyes closed, looks like she's very content. Barrel cactus live for maybe a couple of centuries, and they're full of moist pulp like a giant potato. So if you have a big set of horns that weigh 20 some pounds and you've learned that um, barrel cactus have moist pulp inside and they're good eating, you might use your horns to bash in the top of that barrel cactus, break all the spines out of the way and come and take advantage of that moist pulp. Now if you're a bigger ram, you might come and kick this guy off of this luscious meal that he's got, and he doesn't really have any choice. So a lot of bighorn life revolves around being dominant over the other animals, especially among the rams. So rams sport this wonderful set of horns, which gives them their name. Anybody in here speak Spanish and know what a ram is called in Spanish? The Spanish name for, for bighorn or wild sheep is borrego, borrego cimarron, but the rams are called macho, which some of us in here can relate to because we think we're macho. So macho, big, dominant, tough, get their way. You can see the deep uh, annular rings in the, in the horn. When late summer comes along, coincides with the breeding season, there's a big hormone change in the rams, and the growth of the horn comes almost to a, a screeching halt. And it causes 
uh, a very tight growth ring, much like the winter ring on a, in a tree during the winter, where uh, we can go along and count those deep rings and estimate the age of these animals. Underneath the horns, we find that the skull is supremely adapted for carrying these large horns. The horns and the skull on a really big ram dried out may weigh as much as 30 pounds. So we have a bony core, part of the skull, and if we cut that thing in half with a, with a saw, we'll notice the inside is not solid, but it's an engineered lattice work like a bridge that has adapted to these high impact head-to-head -head combat uh, episodes that rams have. So the horn is an outer sheath that grows on this bone, much like your fingernail grows over the tip of your finger. And there's a membrane in there that has a lot of vessels in it and feeds the new growth of the horn. The only live part of the horn really is at the base of the horn. And we'll see the base is real dark material. That's the newest growth. So rams, even though one may be dominant over the other, they'll often hang out together. You might see a group of 10 or 12 or 15. And within that group, they probably all know who the, the dominant ram is. It's much like junior high school boys. You don't actually have to fight every day if you're the dominant ram, but you have to make the other rams think that you're the toughest. So you show off your horns. Every once in a while you have to fight do a head-to-head -head combat, and the loser will turn around and walk off. But we see them buddying around together quite a bit. During the breeding season, which here might start in, in late July or so and go on into October, we see a lot of rams out on their own. And sometimes this is when the Bighorn Institute gets a call that there's a ram out hanging out in a nursery over in Indio or La Quinta somewhere couple miles from the mountain. And this ram has seen the mountain range on the other side over in the Oracopias or the Chocolates and he's decided he's going over there to look for females. And unfortunately in this country he gets himself, you know, in trouble with civilization. But look at, look at the uh, story that these horns tell. Head-to-head -head combats, broomed off, chips, scarred noses. Imagine surviving out in the desert for 10 or 12 years, 10 or 12 summers, and traveling sometimes 50 to 75 miles in, in search of females in the heat of the summer. So their life revolves around displays, showing off. This guy's got his, his neck all stretched out, his uh, nostrils are flared, he's showing off uh, his horns, he's got a big a uh, scent gland right there in front of his eye that can produce a waxy material. He can rub it on rocks and trees and other animals that uh, says he's been here. People come along and they say, well, I want, I want you to explain what's going on in this photograph. During the breeding season, these guys are running on hormones and I cannot tell you what's going through this guy's little brain. All I can say about this picture is it gives rise to the word rambunctious. And the other three younger rams are looking there and going, do I have to do that someday? Doesn't make any, why are you doing that? So they will butt rocks, creosote bushes. We've had rams numerous times actually come down to the back of a house and see themselves in the reflective film on a sliding glass door. They're very impressed with that ram and they end up inside the living room after they smash through. That's happened at least three times that I know of. Four monster rams, one beautiful female. So Jeff Young, the photographer, calls this undivided attention. And as you can see, she's not exactly running away. She'll play coy and, and give these guys a good chase sometimes for a number of days, but sooner or later, if they give up, she'll come back. And among those four rams, I'm sure that 
there is one dominant ram who's going to get probably first first uh, opportunity to breed with a female. So when a uh, couple rams can't make the decision peacefully who's in charge, they'll often have to turn to head-to-head -to -head combat. And it's not a fight that is intended to cause death or injury. It's a fair fight. You can see one has his head turned one way and one the other way. Very often they'll come together at a full run and all eight feet will be off the ground as they make head-to-head -head combat. Now this is a sound that, you know, how quiet it is out here in the desert when you're out hiking. This can be heard more than a mile away. If you're in a canyon, it will echo off the walls like a rifle shot. At Borrego, our rangers have re repeatedly been called to, over to the campground for a report of gunshots. And they get over there, there's not a car in the parking lot. It's August, it's humid, it's 112. You think, there's nobody over here. And on one particular time, they went through the campground and underneath a shade ramada were two large rams with their mouths open panting. And it was determined they were doing head-to-head -head combat, ritualized combat. So the dominant rams often get the best opportunity to breed with the females. And they will actually test the female's receptivity. If a female is coming into heat, which she'll do for about 48 hours or so, the rams will be there days ahead, following her and constantly testing the waters. See, uh, when her hormones tell them that she's receptive, then the ram will take a little uh, dip into it and he'll put his head back and do a lip curl. He's kind of doing a chemical test here. And uh, if, if he gets the green light, then he will attempt to breed with the female. If he is successful, then she will become impregnated. She won't go back into heat again and she'll carry that lamb for about six months. So this happens in the summer. She's going to give birth in February, March or so, maybe April. And, uh, and the cycle continues. Now we've talked about all the wonderful adaptations that Desert Bighorn have developed in their, say, several hundred years here in the, in the New World in the Western Hemisphere. And despite all their wonderful adaptations, we still find they're quite vulnerable to uh, human encroachment, to uh, both diseases from livestock and to uh, human civilization encroaching on their historic habitat. One of the biggest impacts is that when humans came out west, whether they were uh, coming out for the gold rush or prospecting or ranching, um, homesteaders, they very often had to take up residence very close to water. So time and again throughout the west in the desert, we find there's a, a nice spring or a small stream and there's a cabin right next to it. And what that did is it actually precluded much wildlife like desert bighorn from using that spring they'd used for thousands of years. So in today's world, we have found so many natural sources of water have been taken away from wildlife that we have begun putting water sources back into the wild. So we build a structure called a, a bighorn watering system or a guzzler we stretch a large plastic, hypalon plastic sheet out, it's about 30 by 30 feet, collects rainwater. Rainwater goes downhill to a little dam in a perforated pipe and is stored in these camouflage tanks. So we, we gather rainwater, we store about 5,000 gallons, and then the steel box there in the lower center of that is actually a drinker box, one foot by one foot surface of water, and inside that box is a float valve, much like your toilet. So as the sheep come and drink and the float sinks, it opens the valve and demands more water. And uh, in a classic uh, example of the impact these watering devices have on sheep populations, 
we monitored a mountain range in central Anza Borrego over about uh, the last 50 years. And the population just seemed to struggle, 25, 30 bighorn. Beautiful habitat, but uh, no water left out in the interior of the mountain range. We put six of these guzzlers in to replace six native waters that had been taken. And today, that population of 25 is now up around 150 bighorn. Another impact that has uh, come to the west with the uh, advancement of civilization and livestock grazing and farming is a native plant that comes from the Middle East called the tamarisk tree. You guys all see tamarisk trees along the rail ra railway out here uh, off Highway uh, 10 and Highway 86. Uh, you find it in the, all the canyons and has a beautiful purple flower which unfortunately puts off hundreds of thousands of seeds which are then spread by flash floods and wind and carried from place to place by wildlife, birds, and all that. And a single tree has been estimated to uh, consume about 200 to 300 gallons of water per day. So if you've got 100 of these, imagine, you know, calculate that out, you have you know, thousands of gallons of water being taken out of that system that's not going to come to the surface as a spring. So down in Anza Borrego, we have been killing tamarisk for about 40 years, and we've treated 150 miles of stream courses, and it's had a tremendous positive impact on the quality of, of the streams and the springs and the riparian systems and the wildlife. Something as innocuous as a little plant, a tree, you wouldn't think could have such a profound impact. In today's world, uh, especially here in the upper Coachella Valley, it's not a surprise to you folks that uh, alternative forms of energy have really come to the desert big time in the last couple of decades. Um, down our way toward the Mexican border, uh, we just had our first wind generator project put in, 117 wind generators, unfortunately placed in bighorn habitat. And in a large valley, the bighorn used to walk from one mountain range to another to have their lambs. And um, actually, one of the wind generators was placed in a bighorn lambing area. And when the biologist said, hey, you can't put them here, this is a bighorn lambing area. We have six females that come here the last few years, and they have lambs here. Instead of prohibiting the company from putting that wind turbine there, the federal government actually wrote them a permit allowing them to impact this group of bighorn. It's called a take permit. And it was the most astounding thing I've seen in, in almost four decades working in government, that the law and justice did not prevail, that big business prevailed and wildlife and you know, our philosophy of protecting land uh, was lost. So now we have power lines and wind generators. Now you might say, well, you know, if you're an environmentalist, then wind generators and big solar farms out in the desert must be a good thing. And maybe the idea of solar panels is a good thing, but they have to be in the right place. So what many of us advise is to really charge ahead, full steam ahead, on rooftop solar, both here in the desert and over in the city where most energy is consumed. A lot of these big projects that are being undertaken in the desert are actually shipping energy into Los Angeles and San Diego and Orange County. So we're giving up public lands out in the desert. Right now there's a plan to build alternative energy on two million acres of California desert and ship all that energy, you know, through these big power towers over to the city. So we would prefer that the energy and the, the money and all of that be put into generating the electricity over in the cities where it's going to be used and protecting our desert environment. I think we're all familiar with Palms to Pines Highway the road up Chino Canyon to the valley station of the tramway, 
Montezuma Grade down in Borrego, Interstate 8 down near the Mexican border. These uh, paved roads have all bisected traditional, you know, historic bighorn sheep habitat. And bighorn and roads do not get along together very well. Right, right out in front of the library over the years, before the fence was built across the street behind the, the uh, veterinary clinic, we had numerous bighorn killed right here on, this, on Highway 111 and on Highway 74. So um, we have tried to work out strategies that will allow bighorn to continue their passage from one mountain range to another like they have for hundreds of thousands of years without uh, you know, being Im impacted by these roads. The state of Arizona has taken a novel approach and they have built three of these wildlife overpasses. On the highway between Hoover Dam and Kingman, Arizona, on Highway 93, the state of Arizona Department of Highways built three overpasses designed to allow not only bighorn but other desert wildlife to cross from one mountain range to the other like they've been doing for many generations. So they built these overpasses, they landscaped the tops of them, the bighorn come from up on high ground, they look down and they see this natural turf that crosses the highway and they took to it right away. In the first 20 months, there were more than 2,100 bighorn crossings of these three wildlife overpasses. So the first impression when I say wildlife overpasses, I usually get the crowd kind of giggling and thinking, you gotta be kidding. We're spending taxpayer money on, a, on an overpass for sheep. But when you see the effectiveness of it and the fact that it now protects not only the bighorn, but drivers on that highway from crashes and deaths and injuries, then uh, it starts to make sense. So when these highways were built, like Palms to Pines and Montezuma Grade, if they were built today, we Bighorn supporters would recommend, first of all, it not be built in sheep habitat, but if it had to be, we would build it so it would go through a few tunnels and allow the sheep to cross from one side to the other without having to get hit by cars. This is a scene that's uh, not uncommon here in the Coachella Valley. It used to be very common right across the street at Thunderbird Estates. They used to come down in the flat right next to the vet clinic. And now they're on uh, three golf courses in La Quinta and one in uh, Indian Wells. Um, and I just met a gentleman here who says he sees sheep every day over in La Quinta on the golf course and he had a whole bunch of pictures. And then you saw the one in the paper yesterday so um, this scene is in Boulder City, Nevada, at a city park. They have as many as 75 bighorn that come down out of the river mountains on hot days, and they come down and lounge around on the grass. Now, 75 sheep in one, plot, in one spot, something bad's going to happen, is my prediction. Disease, poisonous plants, parasites that can reproduce in the grass, uh, I talked to folks over there and they said, oh, we just love it because when we have company that comes to Las Vegas, we always bring them over here to the park, show them bighorn sheep. And when I said, what do you think about building a fence so they can't come down? Oh, no, that would be terrible. So that's looking at it, you know, through our eyes, but through, say, looking forward into the future for the welfare of bighorn, the best thing for them out at Boulder City would be to exclude them from this grassy park. Now, the controversy over at La Quinta is that there was an agreement made before those golf courses were constructed that if sheep did come down on the golf course, the city of La Quinta and the golf course owners would construct a fence to exclude them. Now that it is happening, then there's some resistance over there. So you'll see it in the, in the desert sun again. I'm sure about a year ago, there were quite a few letters to the editor and articles about it. It's controversial. Um, those of us who work with Bighorn and care about their future think that it'd be a great thing to put a fence up. We have uh, one golf course down in Borrego Springs, De Anza Country Club, where we had as many as 37 sheep on the, uh, down on the grass, on the greens at one time last, last season. 
and we're working with the uh, homeowners association right now with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to construct a fence, both on state park property and on the golf course property. So we continue to do a lot of research. Uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Bighorn Institute, all the fish and game and game and fish agencies in the West and in Mexico continue to use radio telemetry and satellite uh, GPS uh, technology to monitor sheep. We're able to follow sheep sometimes on a daily basis and determine when lambs are born, when they're getting into trouble. We have a mode on the collar that actually tells us when the collar quits moving for three or four hours and it switches to a mortality mode and it alerts us that this, this animal has died. So a lot of work going on. It's very expensive. These agencies need your support. Nonprofit organizations like the Bighorn Institute right here in Palm Desert uh, always appreciate your support, whether it's financial or whether it's, uh, you know, when something pops up in the letter to the editor that looks like it's uh, not something that you heard here at this talk, and then, you know, speak up and uh, be responsible voters and citizens. A wise bighorn biologist said that uh, the future of bighorn sheep in North America depends less on their adaptations than on the goodwill of humans, because we really do hold their future in our hands. And there are 39 million of us here in California now, and if it wasn't for dedicated individuals and organizations maintaining these wilderness areas, then uh, one of our wilderness icons would not be here today and would not persist into the future. Our goal in doing this book is to get the word out on a wide scale throughout the Western United States and in Mexico about the wonders of this beautiful animal and its great adaptations, but also its vulnerability and how it really depends on all of us to assure the future so our kids and our grandkids can go out and have the same wonderful experiences out in the wilds as we've enjoyed being here up to now. So thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan, for hosting us. You've been a great group. Thank you.